Jokey, Visions of a Torn World. Skipping past the introduction here. The flowing river never stops, and yet the water never stays the same. Foam floats upon the pools, scattering, reforming, never lingering long. So is with man and his dwelling places here on earth. In our glorious capital, the rooftops of the houses of the high and lowly stand in line and seem to jostle for prominence. They appear to have endured for generations, but look more closely. Those that have stood for long, few are, are few indeed. One year they burn down and the next they raised again. Great houses fade away to be replaced by lesser ones. Thus too those who live in them. The place itself does not change, nor does the crowds. Even so, of all the many people I once knew, only one or two remain. They are born into dusk and die as the day dawns, like that foam upon the water. People die and are born. Whence they come and where they go, I do not know, nor do I understand the transitory homes they built. For whom do they fret themselves? What can they be so pleasing to the eye? A house and its master are like the dew that gathers on the morning glory, which will be the first to pass. Sometimes the dew falls away while the flowers stay, but they, they will surely wilt in the morning sun. Sometimes the flower shrivels while the dew holds on, but it will not outlive the day. In the 40 or so years since I reached the age of understand, to understand the heart of things, I have witnessed many awful happenings. One night long ago, it would be the 28th day of the fourth month of the third year of August, a loud wind was blowing. At eight o'clock, a fire broke out in the southeast of the city, then spread north and west. The fire finally reached the south gate of the palace. This gate, together with the state chamber, university hall, and office of the interior, all burned to ashes in one night. They say it started at... Higuchi Tominokoji, the lodgings of the company of dancers. The wind blew wildly, this way, that way, and the fire spread like an unfolding fan. Houses far away engulfed in smoke. Closer by hungry flames licked the ground sky crimson about uh, all about cinder flashing lit by fire flames driven by unrelenting gusts flew whole blocks who in all this would be so scared to death some suffocated by smoke fell upon the ground some swallowed by flames died at once. Some scarce able to save themselves lost their worldly goods, all their worldly goods. Many treasures reduced to ash. Dreadful loss. The fire destroyed 16 noble houses. Who knows how many more? 
I heard one capital of the entire capital, one third of the entire capital. Scores of men and women perished, countless horses, countless cattle, also died. All the man's doings are senseless, but spending his wealth and tormenting himself to build a house in this harmonious city in especially fool is especially foolish. Then, in the fourth month, of the fourteenth year of Jishu came a great whirlwind, which stuck Kyogu and blew the far as Rokudo. It blasted three four city blocks. No house, big or small, once caught by this wind, was left unscathed. Some were leveled, some left with only posts and beams. The wind wretched off gates and dropped them blocks away. It flung down fences so that one plot of land merged with the next. Household goods were tossed into the sky, thatched and shingled, danced wildly in the wind like winter leaves dust rose like smoke so nothing could be seen the din so intense no human voice could be heard the very winds of hell must be this loud not only houses were destroyed many people were hurt maimed trying to save their homes then the wind moved south and cause more grief. Wind often blow, winds often blow, but ever with such force. It was all so freakish. I thought it must be an omen. And then in the sixth month of that fourth year of Jisho, the capital was suddenly moved. This was deeply shocking. I understand the city of Kyoto was for founded in the reign of Saga, so by now some of my 400 years had passed. No, not an easy manner, matter to dis transplant it on a whim. Small wonder people muttered angrily, but protest was to no avail. The first and first the emperor. Then ministries, the nobles of the highest rank, all moved to the new capital, who in high office could, be stand, could stay behind. Those who yet craved rank or position and depended up on the patronage of masters tried to move as quickly as they could. Those who had missed their chance had failed to gain office or had otherwise lost hope were left behind lamenting. Once proud mansions fell to ruin as the days went by, houses were demolished the floating down and floated down the river, Yodu River, and while they ground while the ground where they had stood turned into fields before your eyes, people's values were changed. They preferred horse and saddle. No need now for ox or coach. All now sought estates in the south and west. No one wanted land in the north and east. Around that time, some business took me to the new capital in the country of Tsu. When I saw the place, I thought it cramped indeed, no place for city blocks. In the north, the land rose towards the hills. In the south, it sloped away down to the sea. Everywhere, the crash of waves and a strong sea breeze. The place in the hills brought to mind an ancient wooden lodge, somehow odd enough 
To give an air of elegance, I wondered where they were building houses with the wood from those dismantled day by day, bottling up the river. For there were many more empty lots, and few standing houses. The old capital was in ruins, and while the new was yet to rise, everyone felt adrift clouds. The natives of the place had lost their land, and they were distraught. Those moving there sighed at the chore, and having to build anew. When you look around, and those you might expect in carriages were now on horseback. Those you thought to see in court attire were in common dress, and the style of the capital they suddenly changed. Former gentlemen now seemed mere providential soldiers, and this was felt to be prelude to civil chaos. Sure enough, time passed and confusion, anguish filled the hearts of all. Indeed, grievances were so acute that this same winter, winter the capital was returned, but what the houses now destroyed, they could not be built again exactly as before. I have heard that the distant past, um, this nation was governed with compassion by certain wise rulers. The palace was thatched with common reeds and eaves left ragged. When the emperor saw smoke rise thinly from the people's hearths, he waived already modest taxes. This was an act of mercy to a desire to help his people to understand the world of today, hold it up to the world of long ago. Later, was it the Yowa era? So long ago that I forget, came a famine lasting two full years brought such misery. First in spring and summer, there was drought. Then in autumn, gales and floods. These terrible events came one upon another. Finally, the grain crops failed. People plowed in summer and planted in summer, but in vain. There was no happy bustle of autumn harvest, of laying away in winter. In every region, people gave up farms and homes, others left for the hills, many prayers were chanted, rituals performed with no result. Kyoto always has real, relied on the countryside, but now supplies stopped. And soon, all dignity was lost. People steal themselves to sell off possessions now of no value. There was a little trade, but grain was worth more than gold. Beggars were many in the streets. Clamor of suffering, sorrow filled the air. In this way, the year struggled to its close. There was hope. Things might improve that following year. But then, on the top of it, the great plague broke out, stood the world upon its head. Everyone was starving. Time passed and things grew worse. People seemed like fish in a shrinking pool. Dick Decorously dressed folks in hat and gaiters went from house to house frantically begging. Even if you, as you watch, stricken people walking by would suddenly fall. So many bodies of the starved lay in the streets hard by the walls of houses. Since there were no removed, not removed, the, there rose a dreadful stench. Dreadful stench. It was more than people could bear it, it to look upon the rotting corpses. Worse 
still beside the river, not even room for horse or cart to pass. The woodcutters all starving, firewood disappeared, with nothing else, some tore down their homes and took the wood to market. It was said the value of this wood was not enough to live on for one day. Then I baffled finding kindness, kindling, sorry, kindling painted red and catching glimpses of gold leaf. I inquired and found someone had been reduced to breaking into temples, stealing images of Buddha, tearing out the fittings of the walls and chopping them to bits sinful times that I should witness such a dreadful thing but then so many other sights and break to break the heart loving couples who the one whose love was deeper always died first they held back gave the meager food to their dearest in families parents always were the first to pass away I saw babies lying and sucking breasts unaware their mothers were already dead. A certain monk, Kyokyo Hoin of Ninaja, Ninaji, felt great pity for the multitudes of dying. When he came upon a dying man, he performed last rites, traced the holy mark upon the brow to tally the of the dead, he counted two full months on the streets of Kyoto, bound north and south by Ichiju and Kujo, east and west by Kyoto and Suzuki. The corpses numbered 40,000. This did not include the many, many dead before or since. And to this, the outskirts, by the river of Shirawi, Nishinokyo, the other parts and the provinces along the seven highways, dead without numbers, I hear tell of another such calamity in the past, in the days of Emperor Sutoko, in the year of, years of Shu, Shoshu. So, so, but I don't, but I know nothing of that time. All I know is that I was the very worst I've ever seen. Soon, I wonder, now, when is it? A great quake shook the earth. This, too, was a terrible event. Mountains fell and filled the rivers, and the sea heaved and flooded the land. The earth itself split and water gushed out. Giant rocks cracked and rolled down into the valleys. Boats along the shore were helpless in the waves. Horses on the street stumbled as they walked. Around the capital, no one, no one temple or pagoda remained intact. Some collapsed and some fell over. Dust and ashes rose like billows of smoke. Earth shaking, houses breaking. Sounds sounded like a crash of falling thunderbolts. Caught inside a house might crush you. Outside the ground was torn apart. Without wings you could not fly. Only a dragon may ride the clouds. Surely such an earthquake is the most terrifying of events. In time the violent shaking stopped. But aftershocks continued, even days, twenty, thirty quakes, every each one fright, frightening enough in normal times. Only the ten or twenty days did they begin to ease. Sometimes they were four or five shocks, then two or three, then fewer or fewer. These aftershocks lasted for about three months. Of the four elements, water, fire, and wind, often cause great damage. Earth does not so often bring catastrophe. Long before, in the year of Psycho, there have been, there had been an earthquake that once 
even caused the head of the great Buddha to dodge to fall, and as well as many other fearful things. But from all I hear, there was no equal to this quake from the um, for a while, while um, after there was talk of the vanities of this world. And people seem to be rid of sinfulness in their hearts. But days and months went by, then years, and no one smoke, spoke of it again. So as we see our life is hard in this world, we and our houses, fleeting, hollow, many troubles flow from your status, social rank. The lowly man who lives beside the man of power cannot openly rejoice even when glad. And when sorrow becomes intolerable, he never can cry out. His anxious air, his constant fearful trembles are those of a sparrow near the nest of a hawk. The poor man who lives near the rich man is shamed by shabbiness. He goes in and out by day or night without self-effacing air. He sees the envy of his wife, servant, children, servants. He knows the rich despise them all and his heart is troubled. Never, never can he find peace. If you live among crowds, you cannot flee when fire breaks out. If you live, if you wish to live far from others, traveling is hard, and there is a danger to thieves. Power, the powerful are greedy. Those who stand alone are always mocked. Men of means have much fear. Those with none know only bitterness. If you entrust yourself to the care of others, you will be owned by them. If you care for others, you will be enslaved by your own solitude. If you comfort Conform to the world, it will bind you by hand and foot. If you do not, then you think, then it will think you mad. And so the question, where should we live and how? Where to find a place to rest for a while? And how bring ever short lived peace to our hearts? As for me, I came into property from my father's mother. I lived there for a long while, but then came death, my family split, and I came down in the world. Memories were warm, but I could not stay, and after 30, by myself, I built a house one-tenth the size of my former home. I built a simple living place, but had no means to build what most would think a proper house. I put the outer walls, but I could not afford a gate. I set up a bamboo poles as shelter for my cart. And when it snowed or when the wind blew, my house felt precarious. It was near the river, so dangerous from flood, so danger from flooding always loomed. The place it out was also overrun by thieves. In much of this way, with often troubled mind, I struggle for 30 years in this unkind world. In this time, my best intentions foiled. I came to understand my hopeless luck. Therefore, in my 50th spring, I retired from the world. In any case, I had no wife or child, no family to regret. I had no rank, no revenue. So where the world ties? In idleness, I lay down on Mount O'Hara, clouds my pillow and some five springs, and autumn went by. Then, well into my sixth decade, when... I 
when the dew of life disappears, I built a little hut, a leaf from which the last drops might fall. I was a wayfarer, raising a rude shelter, an old silkworm spinning one last cocoon. Unlike the house of my middle years, this is not even one hundredth the size. The fact is, I get older, my houses get smaller. As a house in, it is unique, ten by ten, the height no more than seven. No one commit, no, with no commitment to any one place, I laid no claim to the land. I laid planks off in the ground and covered it simply. The joints were held with me metal hasps. This is so I can quickly move if something would dis displease me. No trouble to rebuild, for it will fill just two carts. The only cost the carter's fee. I hide myself away deep in the hills of Hino. On the east side, I have added three foot awning to use the space below to strip the burned brushwood. By the south wall, I lay down a bamboo mat and the west of that, a shelf for operatory goods. On the north side, behind the screen of the image of Amida, and next to it, Fugen, I, in front of them, the Lotus Sutra. On the eastern side, bedding of dried bracken for night's rest. In the southwest, um, a bamboo ledge three with three leather linen blankets for poetry and music, and the works of Oyo Yoshu. Next to the shelf against the wall, a koto and baiwa, known to folding koto jointed baiwa. Such is my little home in this world outside to the, um, outside to the south. A water pipe with stones to hold the water. A wood nearby providing twigs and seedlings in abundance. The hills are called Toyama and spindle trees shade the path. The valley is thick with trees and I have a view of the western heavens fo focused for meditation. In the spring, wisteria rippling like waves, blooming like holy purple cloud to the west in summer cuckoos. As they chatter on, I ask them to be sure to guide me through the mountain pass of death. In autumn, their voices of circling cicadas fill my ear. They seem to grieve the husk of the world. Then in winter, snow, it settles just like human sin and smelts. So, melts in astonishment when in no mood for chanting nor caring to read sutras I can choose to rest I can be lazy and um, if I like no one here to hinder me no one in whose eyes to feel ashamed I took no vow of silence yet performance Yet perforce observe one, I as I am alone. I need not try to obey commandments. Little chance to break them here. In the morning when my heart is full of the white-topped wake the fl that flows astern, I look out to the boats play plying around Okinawa and write in the manner of men Mashimi. Men shami. In the evening, when the wind blows through the katsura tree and makes the leaves dance, I think of Jinya River and play in it imitating Kentoku. When the mood wakes me, when the mood takes me, again and again I play the song of Autumn Breeze and to the wind of the pipes. 
our flowing water to the sound of the stream. Though little skilled, I do not play to please another's ear. I play just for myself to sing to the ser- sustenance of my own heart. That is a simple hut of brushwood at the foot of the hill where the mountain keepers live. There is a little boy who visit, sometimes visits when all of is still i walk with this companion he is 10 i am 60 to the difference is great yet both delight we pick buds and shrubs and gather bulbs and herbs or go to the fields to the foot of the hill and gather fallen ears of rice and make different shapes when the day is fine, we climb up to the hilltop and look for the, at the sky above my former home. We can see Kowata Hills, Fushimi, Toba, and Hatsusakashi. A place of beauty has no owner, so there's nothing to spoil the pleasure. When we are fit and feel like going farther, we walk to the hills through Samyama, beyond Kasatori, visit Iwami, or make a pilgrimage to Ishiyama, or we make our way across the fields of Awazu and visit the former home of the poet Samyama. Maru, or cr- across Tagami River to the grave of Saramu- Samaro. Coming back, depending on the season, we look at the cherry blossoms, view maples, pluck bracken, gather nuts and as offerings, or take home. On quiet nights, I recall friends looking at the moon through the window. I listen to the distant cries of monkeys and te- tears wet my and tears wet my sleeves fireflies in the bushes that and appear then appear like fishermen's braziers off the menishume the morning rain feels like a storm beating the leaves when i hear the toneful cries of copper pheasants they sound like my father and mother when deer from higher up come tamely down to me i realize how far i am from the world awakening my night and poking embers from the ashes this old man finds his company the mountains do not daunt me so i enjoy the hooting of the owl each passing season brings its own enchantment of course a more perceptive man would find much more to charm. When I moved here, I did not mean to stay this long, but years pa- now have passed. This rough shelter has become my home. Rotting pile of, on, p- rotting leaves pile up on the roof, moss grows in the lower parts, occasional words of the capital tell me many lords have passed away, while I was hidden here in the hills, others too of lesser rank numbered can numbers can we never know. I wonder how many houses burned down by the constant fires, but nothing happened here in my little hut. Small as it is, there is a room to sleep at night and sit by day, space enough for one man. The hermit crab prefers a tiny shell awareness of its needs. Osprey live by the rocky coast and fear, fearing the world of man. And so with me, I know my needs and I know the world. I wish for nothing and, but, and I do not work to acquire things. Quiet is my own wish to be free from worry, happiness enough. People in the world do not build houses to suit their real needs. They build houses for wives, children, red news, (laughs) or they build for friends and those around them. Some build houses for masters and teachers or even for their treasures, oxen, horses. I have built one 
for myself alone. You may wonder why. The world today has its ways and I have mine. I have no companion here. Even if I built a bigger, who, even if I built bigger, who would receive, I receive here? Who would I have li lived to live in it? In their friends, people see like certain affluence affluence and re ready smile they seldom care for the warmth and truthfulness so why do you find your friends in song and nature why not servants valued tangible rewards as well as constant favors they seek not no care or sympathy nor contentedness or harmony why not be your own servant but how to be a servant there when there is something to be done, employ your body. It is harder. It is hard yet simple and using someone else and being obliged. When you need to go somewhere, use your feet. This is too hard, but not as hard as worrying about a horse or a saddle, ox or cart. Now as I divide my body and give it twofold purpose, my hands are servants, my legs are my carriage. This suits me well. My heart knows my strengths limit and makes me rest when I am tired. I work again when ready. I exert myself, but never to excess. So even when fatigued, I'm not distressed. Always walking, always working makes my spirit strong. Why rest without need? Using others is a sin. Why should I wish to use another? Just the same food with food and clothing. My clothes are arrow, my clothes are arrowroot. My bedding hemp. I make do with what I find for dress. Starwort from the fields, berries from the hills are all that we need of sustenance. I need of sustenance, not mingling with society. My appearance does not matter. My food being meager tastes all the sweeter. But I do, I do not speak of those pleasures to reproach the rich. I just compare my life with the present. Reality depends upon your mind alone. If your mind is not at peace, what are the use of riches? In the grandness hall, will never satisfy. I love my lovely dwelling, this one room hut. Sometimes I go to the capital and I am aware I look like a begging monk where I return. I pity those who seek the dross of the world. If you doubt my words, consider the fish and the birds. Fish do not hate the water, but then none can know the happiness of the fish unless he is one. Birds love the woods, but if you are not a bird, you will never know its truth. A quieter life is much the same. How would anyone know it without living it the moon of my life is setting the life now lets me sink left me sinks in the hills into the hills any time now i may descend to the darkness of the river below to what end do i pour this out buddha taught me we must not be attached yet the way i love this hut is itself attachment to be attached to the quiet serene must likewise be a burden no more shall i waste speaking useless pleasures seeking useless pleasures the morning is quiet and i have meditated much on the holy teaching this is what I ask myself. You left the world to live in the woods, to quiet your mind and live the holy way. But though you appear to be a monk, your heart is soaked in sin. Your home is modeled on that of Vimaliruti. The present practices are not mindful, and those of Sudupaka. Sudupantaka is your lowly life surely consequence of past deeds troubling you now? Has your discerning mind just served to drive you mad?
To these questions of mind, there is no answer. So now I use my impure tongue to offer a few prayers to Amida and then some silence.